History is always political, and I think that uh, everyone in this room is familiar with this concept. However, the lessons that were taught in school leave out the important context, right? Reducing history to just a mere list of dates, people, isolated events. Um, and so, as Marx once said, history of all hitherto existing society is a history of class struggles. And understanding the progression of society and social forces at play situates these seemingly isolated points into synchronization. And this is the very tool that connected my experience as a second generation Chinese American to the communist struggle. It is this that taught me that racism against Chinese people from the moment the first Chinese worker stepped foot on this country is a story familiar to all of us today. Analyzing this history is critical as we continue the fight for immigrant and worker rights. I myself come from a family of migrant workers. Um, my great-great-grandfather was a migrant worker in Australia until he died on the boat uh, on his fourth trip back to China. My great-grandfather immigrated to Peru to find work, and my parents immigrated to the US. So May 6th, which is this Sunday, um, will be the 136th anniversary of the Chinese Exclusion Act, the seminal law restricting immigration in the US. So when California Senator John Miller first introduced this bill to Congress, it actually called for a 20-year ban. Um, President Arthur uh, actually vetoed this bill despite the rampant racism among his peers and his base uh, because he feared that the Qing government would shut Chinese ports uh, from American trade. However, there was so much kind of reactionary backlash that when the bill was amended to 10 years in 1882, uh, it was approved. The act uh, originally meant to, was kind of uh, originally meant to restrict immigration from China uh, and two years later, the act was amended to only allow Chinese laborers to freely travel between the US and China if they arrived before November 1880, which was the last time a treaty was signed with China. In 1888, this amendment was overturned by the Scott Act. This meant that Chinese laborers had no rights to reentry. At this point, 20,000 Chinese were unable to come back to the US despite having uh, owned property, businesses, having families in the US, and 600 Chinese en route to the US with government issued certificates were den uh, denied upon entry. Um, so despite the 10-year ban, this law was later extended by the Gary Act for another 10 years, requiring all Chinese laborers to register with the government within one year. Without such documentation, Chinese workers were subjected to immediate deportation. Chinese immigrants had no guaranteed protection in the courts should they be detained. And in 1902, when the Gary Act expired, another act was passed to extend the Chinese Exclusion Act indefinitely. And it wouldn't be until after World War II, over half a century since the Seminole Act came into law, uh, that it was repealed when the Chinese proved their nationalism to the US during wartime. This later became the common weapon used by the ruling class to enforce restrictions and intimidations for all groups of immigrants, right? We see that today. So the first wave of um, Chinese immigrants came to the US during the 1850s to California. The, the gold rush just uh, had begun in, in 1849 with the disco uh, discovery of gold and set into motion an enormous influx of prospectors, white settlers from the east. Um, this brought with it uh, the genocidal extermination of many native tribes in California. The decline of the Qing government imposed heavy taxes uh, and oppression upon its people. There were food shor uh, shortages and social unrest. The instability of the Qing government ultimately forced many Chinese to travel uh, far distances for better economic opportunities. Most of uh, the Chinese, uh, these Chinese immigrants are from southern parts of China, and during this time, Guangdong province, uh, one of the southernmost provinces of China, where my parents are actually from, uh, faced an unimaginable amount of natural disasters, sharp population increase, uh, and exploitation of peasants and workers by wealthy landlords. So um, 
At the same time, China had just suffered a humiliating defeat in the first opium war with the United Kingdom between 1839 and 1842. The Treaty of Nanking basically allowed the UK, along with other European nations and the United States, to control China's five treaty ports, uh, free from Chinese uh, rule. And this was also when Hong Kong was ceded to the UK until the handover in 1997 back to the People's Republic of China. So in 1852, 30,000 Chinese immigrants embarked on the journey to Gam San, which is Cantonese for Gold Mountain. Uh, it's a broad term used to describe North America, but now it's a common nickname for San Francisco. Many Chinese went to Hong Kong uh, and then boarded the ships to make this journey, and by 1890, steamships carried a cumulative 200,000 Chinese to the west. Most of these immigrants were poor and lacked education, and while most Chinese immigrants went to the West Coast, actually a handful were sent to the South during Reconstruction Era. Cheap Chinese labor was used to replace black labor, conveniently driving a wedge between the two groups. So it was the exploitation of Chinese labor that aided the westward expansion by building the Central Pacific Railway, um, the first transcontinental railway, a railroad in the US. Chinese workers worked in horrible climates during the coldest of winters and, of course, in poor working conditions, resulting in many workers freezing to death. And it is said that, like, many bodies wouldn't really be found until the snow melted in the spring. Workers uh, worked 11-hour uh, days digging in dangerous tunnels. And actually, in June 1867, 5,000 uh, Chinese railroad workers went on strike, demanding better pay, better working conditions, shorter work days. Uh, food and other supplies for the workers was cut off by Central Pacific, starving and ultimately forcing the workers to end the strike. Although this uh, strike was unsuccessful, Chinese workers organized one of the largest strikes of this time. And also, it's interesting to note that Central Pacific assumed that it was the, their competitor, Union Pacific, that orchestrated this strike, that the Chinese workers were unable to assert their own interests in this way. Chinese workers also worked in agriculture, fishing, mining, and other industries of work. So capitalists, you know, they jump at any opportunity to reap profits, no matter the cost. It is no wonder that the exploitation of cheap Chinese workers were welcomed, driving down labor costs, pitting workers against workers. And unsurprisingly, you know, racism ensued among white workers who saw the Chinese as taking their jobs. So white mobs across the United States led unimaginable rampages of violence, torture, massacres against the Chinese people. And during the late 18, uh, 1800s, there were over 150 documented cases of anti-Chinese riots um, that took place across the west of the US, often burning down and looting businesses, homes, beating and killing Chinese people. When President Arthur originally vetoed the first Exclusion Act, um, the public was so outraged that when the, the amended version of this act passed, it like whipped them up, like it was crazy. Um, this, immediately following the passage of this act, anti-Chinese fanatics um, charted out this period called the driving out period where all out genocide was waged against Chinese people uh, by these mobs. So Chinatowns were of course prime targets in the major cities of the West. Most of the driving out period was highly coordinated by prominent politicians and white residents. Um, and actually this flyer right here is an anti-Chinese uh, mass meeting organized by the mayor of Tacoma. So in 1885 in Tacoma, Washington, 500 Tacoma residents marched through Chinatown, forced its residents uh, by intimidation and violence to pack up their bags and leave the territory. They were herded like cattle to the train station during heavy rainstorm, left to either freeze to death or be lucky enough to make their way to Portland. Chinatown was robbed, looted, and then burned to the ground. And the mayor of Tacoma at the time was celebrated as a hero. Coined the Tacoma method, cities would follow suit in this tactic, dragging innocent Chinese people out of their homes, forcing them to pack whatever they could, and herd them out to the closest point of exit. Seattle was also uh, uh, saw their fair share of um, mass anti-Chinese rallies during this period. 
So riots were so violent that the Secretary of War sent troops to protect the Chinese. And however, instead of protecting them, the soldiers actually collected and seized cash from Chinese residents, or the other option was that they would join the mobs. Um, violence got so bad that the governor, uh, Governor Watson Squire, had to find a way to quell the riots. He, he actually did so by promising the rioters who volunteered to end their rioting activities the legal right to continue the abuse by swearing them in as policemen to protect the Chinese from physical injury. President Cleveland declared martial law and sent federal troops to Seattle. So in Wyoming, white miners um, armed themselves with weapons, marched into Chinatown, kind of the same deal, shot and beat Chinese people to death, and again, ordering them to pack up their bags and leave. Um, buildings were looted, burned down, and as a result of this massacre, 28 Chinese lives were killed. Again, federal troops were uh, summoned to protect the Chinese, and once again, they just aided the riots, mostly. This one is considered one of the worst uh, yet least well-known massacres. Um, the Snake River Massacre of 1887 took place in Oregon where 34 Chinese miners in Hell's Canyon were robbed, killed, and mutilated by white ranchers and schoolboys. And to kind of highlight the level of dehumanization Chinese people faced at the time, the killers actually kept body parts as souvenirs, disposing the rest of it in the river. And in all of these cases, none of the murderers uh, or rioters face any jail time. And in fact, one of the worst mass lynchings in the history of the, of the United States took place here in Los Angeles in 1871, right before the Exclusion Act was passed. A race riot broke out in Chinatown, resulting in 18 Chinese men hanged to death. This is not something we learn about in history at all. So, in 1883, one year after the Exclusion Act was passed, about 8,000 immigrants entered the U.S. Um, in 1885, that number dropped to 22 immigrants, many of these who were from privileged backgrounds. Economic instability was so bad in China that many migrants risked death uh, to be smuggled into the U.S. by way of Canada, uh, Mexico, and the Caribbean. And even though the Exclusion Act was meant to restrict immigration, uh, American-born Chinese, which is also like in like Chinese communities, we call them ABCs, and that's what my dad calls me. Um, ABCs were not immediately granted citizenship until it was disputed by many legal battles. So during a Supreme Court hearing of Wong Kim Ark's case in 1898, Chief Justice Melville Fuller claimed that no matter where someone was born, anyone of Chinese descent uh, always had allegiances to China. The Supreme Court, however, ruled that um, all children born in the U.S. are citizens. And this case, among many cases, would seek to challenge anti-Chinese policies and sentiments to come. So uh, when the Gary Act passed uh, to extend the Exclusion Act, workers in major cities in California uh, and New York organized against it, boycotting the registration policy, um, and in 1899, the U.S. announced the open door policy, allowing the U.S. to develop China for its own commercial interests. At this time, uh, European and Japanese imperialists had already divided most of the coastal regions in China into de facto colonies. Um, the U.S. had just taken the Philippines, a strategic location for the U.S. to trade with China, and this was necessary, right, because at the time, the U.S. capitalists were facing a great crisis of overproduction, and it really needed uh, new markets to, to resolve this crisis. So, interestingly enough, full-scale protests actually erupted in China against the Exclusion Act. In fact, a large-scale boycott of American goods was launched in 1905, where workers quit working for American companies, and 90% 90, 90 of businesses in Shanghai displayed placards supporting uh, this boycott. The boycott gained immense support throughout Asia and was extremely effective. Um, standard oil sales plummeted from 90,000 cases of fuel per month to 19,000. Um, fearing retaliation by Americans, the Qing government actually destroyed this boycott. Uh, relations were already kind of uh, strained with the U.S. and other foreign powers because of the Boxer Rebellion that happened in 1900. This rebellion, led by peasants, uh, were against American Christian missionaries and Chinese converts 
um, centering the rebellion around calling foreign intervention as the basis for Ch uh, China's economic ills. The aftermath of the opium war was devastating, carving up China to be exploited by major imperialist powers. The rebellion was crushed by combined Western military forces. And so even though Chinese Americans had nothing to do with the rebellion, all the way in China, um, and often had zero allegiances to China, this of course contributed to the racism against Chinese people. And we see this again with the Japanese internment camps in World War II. So in 1906, uh, there was an earthquake in San Francisco. I think a lot of us learned about this in school, or maybe I just did because I grew up in San Francisco. <laughs> um, but this earthquake actually provided a loophole for Chinese immigrants. Um, the city was destroyed, and of course, Chinatown was in ruins. The wealthy Chinese uh, had the means to flee, but a vast majority of the Chinese were poor, and, they, and those who were poor stayed behind. Yet, many of them feared uh, white violence, and because of this, they uh, were afraid to go to city-run shelters for food or boarding. And similar to the massacres, uh, whatever belongings and valuables were salvageable were taken by looters and soldiers. You know, the soldiers that usually were to, uh, you know, went in to protect the Chinese, but of course they didn't do that. Um, Chinese banks and businesses were shipped clean, and many refugee camps were opened, but these camps were met with white protesters who feared permanent Chinese relocation into these neighborhoods. And the fires that broke out destroyed all birth and immigration records. So this meant that Chinese immigrants who could convince officials that they were citizens were able to claim sons and wives uh, in China to immigrate. And so this kind of created a black market of sorts to sell citizenship to those who were eager, eager to immigrate. Um, paper sons uh, was the term for recipients of this citizenship. So in 1910, Angel Island uh, in San Francisco Bay Area was converted and established into an immigration facility. Uh, conditions were brutal for Chinese immigrants coming through, and about 75 to 80 percent of Chinese immigrants were detained. And while detained, of course, there was no privacy at all. Um, there were hostile interrogations, uh, those happened regularly, and it was said um, in my research that those who suffered the most were women who were separated from their children. And oftentimes, women were thrown into solitary confinement, um, in, into cells without any windows for weeks at a time. And many of these women ended up committing suicide, right? And we hear these stories over and over again, even today. And during this time, hospitals across San Francisco refused to care for any Chinese patients. And the same is true, was true on Angel Island. It was said that uh, a Chinese man who had meningitis was taken away to an isolated tent where he was kept until he basically died. Um, deportations were equally horrendous. Uh, Chinese workers were packed into railroad cars like sardines and then herded into ships. It was the most brutal during the summers when the ships sailed through the equator. And this subjected Chinese immigrants vulnerable to blackmail with threat of deportation by extorting them of every penny that they had. So shame and terror are understatements of the level of trauma Chinese Americans carry with generations to come. Even I, at a very young age, learned to be ashamed of being Chinese, speaking Chinese, eating Chinese food, embracing Chinese culture. And this is the reality of many oppressed groups. And it was through learning this history and analyzing it from a Marxist perspective um, could I truly embrace my own background. Suddenly, the idea of Chinese and largely Asian uh, immigrants um, as the model minority emerged. Um, the contemporary model minority myth, which props Asian uh, immigrants as those persisted those who persisted despite hardships is used as a wedge to point fingers at other groups of um, immigrants. And this is not only insulting to immigrant communities under attack today, but it largely erases an already hidden past of the brutality faced by Asian immigrant groups, um, you know, throughout the inception of immigration into this country. In fact, the image, um, the image of Asian Americans making it um, in the U.S. severely distorts the truth. In New York City recently, it came out that Asian Americans make up the most impoverished group uh, compared to any group in New York City. And groups like Chinatown Community for Equitable Development here in Los Angeles continue to highlight the many uh, 
Chinese immigrants, mostly seniors, facing poverty and displacement in Chinatown due to gentrification. So we were once deemed uh, fundamentally incapable of assimilating, and our hard work ethic was once seen as alien, inhuman, and strange, robotic. Uh, we were seen as dangerous to peace and security. The 1877 Joint Special Committee to Investigate Chinese Immigration of the Senate and House of Representatives wrote in a report, quote, the burden of our accusation against them is that they come in conflict with our labor interests, that they can never assimilate with us, that they are a perpetual, unchanging, and unchangeable alien element that can never be homogenous, that their civilization is demoralizing and degrading to our people, that they degrade and dishonor labor, that they, ca that they can never become citizens, and that an alien, degraded labor class without desire of citizenship, without education, and without interest in the country it inhabits is an element both demoralizing and dangerous to the community within which it exists." End quote. But of course, the rhetoric is flipped at the convenience of the bourgeoisie, right? When the Chinese labor, when Chinese labor was primed for building the railroads, the president of Central Pacific, Leland Stanford, said that Chinese laborers were competent and wonderfully effective, tireless and unremitting in their industry. He later flipped his stance during the years of the Chinese exclusion. Yet this rhetoric repeats in a loop with any immigrant group that makes their way to the U.S. So. This country was built on the foundation of native genocide and on the backs of enslaved Africans, uh, indentured servants, immigrants, and exploited workers of all nationalities. Oppression by, by many means is woven uh, to the very fabric of American uh, capitalist society. Just today it was announced that 50,000 Hondurans will lose their temporary protective status and have 20 months to leave this country. Analyzing this history is critical for how we move forward as we face bigoted policies like the Muslim ban, the attacks on DACA, TPS, unions, and so forth. This is what concrete solidarity with communities under attack today should be built on, understanding the tactics and tools from this violent history used to divide the workers. We just celebrated International Workers' Day, where thousands of workers, uh, of working people, poured into the streets around the world demanding full rights for immigrants, justice for uh, victims of police brutality and all issues that affect everyday working people. For me, the legacy left behind from the Chinese Exclusion Act needs to be centered in the movement for immigrants' rights. Not because I'm Chinese, but because uh, the xenophobic act unravels all of the bigoted policies against immigrants that follow, um, you know, up until today. And it is also essential that, as revolutionaries, we actively dispel and challenge the, the divisive myth of the model minority. Today, many so-called radical spaces attempt to appear most progressive by buying into this distortion. Um, this effectively erases the struggles faced by many working class Asians and, and attempts to reduce our role in the movement as mere allies to the most oppressed. As communists, we must actively fight against such attempts to place in hierarchy on oppression. This is yet another tool used to divide our struggles, aiding the bourgeoisie's role. We seize power by rejecting these narrow views of struggle and by amplifying our unity, and this is the only way we will defeat imperialism. The proletariat in the United States is multinational. It is heterogeneous and varied in life experiences. But when we recognize that the common enemy, the ruling elite, uh, exploits our diversity by you know, dividing us in order to generate larger sums of profit, then we stand a chance to win. Recognizing the enemy is step one. The second is to organize and uplift the consciousness of our communities. Organizing with the message of unity among the workers is the only way we can lead the movement towards revolution. And this is, this is what May Day is all about, right? Yes, like we want to celebrate the working class, but most importantly, we must continue to fight and organize. So uh, I would like to end this talk by mentioning that today is the 99th anniversary of the student-led May 4th movement in Beijing, which called for national sovereignty and was anti-imperialist in nature. So history has shown us that organizing ourselves to fight our enemies is in our bones. Now let's take what we've learned, organize the workers, and we will win.